Thank you so much, Nelson, and good afternoon. It's a tough act to follow the Google product showcase, but appropriately, I'm going to try to do so because I'm supposed to introduce our panel on innovation. And when innovation happens, one of the most interesting things about it is you don't know where it's going to go. So I want to share some thoughts about where a current cluster of innovation may be taking us, innovation that starts off not just thinking about cloud computing, but what happens when you've got lots of people arrayed in the way that cloud computing is arrayed. So how to begin? Well, let's see if we can get our slides going. Just so you have witnesses, there is a click. Excellent. In 2009, a graduate student in sociology at NYU named Casey Kinzer did a rather unusual experiment. She got what you see in the lower left corner there, a small robot fashioned out of cardboard. She put an all-important smiley face on it. She got a small motor, an electric motor, that propelled it forward at a slow but constant rate. She attached a flag on it, indicating in the first person where the robot wanted to go. And then she released them on the streets of New York City. Now, it's not clear exactly what would happen, especially given it wasn't that long ago that half of Manhattan was shut down by an abandoned lunch pail in Times Square. In this sense, though, something interesting happened. People actually intervened to help the robots get to where they wanted to go. In this chart, you can see a robot starting off in the northeast corner of Washington Square Park and over 40 people intervening, complete strangers, to help escort it to its destination. Now, like most sociology experiments, my first reaction was, that's really interesting. My second reaction was, I have no idea what that means. But I thought it was evocative. It's evocative about the way that strangers can be called upon to be helpful, sometimes for no compensation at all, and not even with a clear idea of what they're doing, so long as there's a smiley face involved. And it starts to get one thinking about the emerging range of platforms that are starting to corral the crowds to be helpful where they can, like cloud computing, cloud human computing, to go ahead on various tasks. And I think of it roughly like a pyramid, where you have some tasks that require so much skill and expertise that maybe only a handful of people out there could contribute, and those might cost you a lot. And then as you go down the pyramid, you can enlist more and more people at a lower and lower rate to somehow be helpful with a project. Now, at the top of the pyramid might be something like the X Prize. The X Prize, of course, started as a way of putting a very large bounty, $10 million, $20 million US dollars, towards some kind of useful social end, like the Google Lunar X Prize. $10 million to the first private group that can land something on the moon, have it move around a little bit, and play a decent game of Fruit Ninja. And then you see people assembling to try to win that X prize. In fact, more money invested trying to win the prize than the value of the prize, which from a social point of view is extremely useful to the group that comes in third, perhaps not as much. But now, towards the bottom of the pyramid is where I want to focus briefly today. And for that, I look at something like Somasource, which starts from the precept that there must be some task that we could give someone in a refugee camp that has an old mobile phone from maybe 10 years ago, but we could make something appear on the screen of that phone such that the person in the camp could respond in a way that adds value to someone far away who might be willing to pay for it. Now, what kind of tasks might those be? Well, for examples, we turn to a phenomenon that is just starting to hit the public consciousness, and that is Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk operates from the premise that it's the 21st century, and yet artificial intelligence isn't exactly where we'd like it to be. It's not as smart as it should be. But what if we had people that could, at the right moments, inject human intelligence into what otherwise is a computing task? We could call it artificial, artificial intelligence. And that's the thesis behind Mechanical Turk, which is, of course, named after the famed Mechanical Turk invented in 1770, which toured the courts of Europe and played a really mean game of chess. This robot somehow managed to play chess. How did it do it? The secret was kept for over 25 years. 
You may have guessed it already. In fact, there's a small person lodged inside the Mechanical Turk that's actually playing the game. Perhaps the world's first, in fact, digital sweatshop. Now, it turns out that this is the metaphor that could be empowering for us, as odd a metaphor as it might be. Where can we put a person inside of something? So for example, here's a task that a firm might have. Perhaps a search engine has a bunch of photos, and they want to have labels attached to them so you could do image search. Well, let's put them out to Mechanical Turks. So here you have, for one US penny, describe what you see. And my bet is you can't help yourself. You just thought, box, box. You're right, here's a penny. Hmm. You move on to the next one. Down there in the corner, trucks, trucks. Yes, here's another penny. Many people do this and they say, I like the odds on this slot machine. And they keep playing. And there's as many images to label as you care to play. And you start accruing one penny after another. They've started doing the demographics of Turkers, those who use Mechanical Turk. It turns out a lot of graduate students do this in their spare time. Either a token of how little our proto-academics are paid. I actually think that it's one of the few areas of positive feedback they get during a multi-year career. <laughs> Here's another Mechanical Turk task. What is the difference between vanilla and French vanilla? It has to be in your own words, just 50 or 60 of them. Answer the question, get three pennies. Who wants to know? I don't know. What are they going to do with it? Not sure. Just answer the question, collect your three pennies, and move right along. This is one of my favorite Mechanical Turk tasks. It's sort of meta. Somebody went on to Mechanical Turk and said, for 50 cents, write on a piece of paper why you do Mechanical Turk. Take a picture of yourself and send it in. And here you have, I Turk for Christmas. I Turk to battle insomnia. I Turk for drug money. Just kidding. I'm not sure I believe him. And this is so evocative because you see this lattice work of people that are the bees inside the honeycomb that drive what otherwise, to somebody with a task, is just an AI, just a machine ready to apply work to a task for a fee at any time, anywhere. And in fact, I think Mechanical Turk and platforms like it aren't going to be retail. It's not as if people walking down the street will be, you know what, Mechanical Turk would be good to help me with this problem. Instead, it will be wholesale. It'll be built into other things. So for example, here's something called Soylent. This is the word processor with a crowd inside. I don't know how many people are familiar with the old American term Soylent. Does that ring a bell? No, in 1970 uh, or so, there was a movie in America called Soylent Green. As you can see, it was a musical comedy. And uh, it depicts this sort of science fiction future where everybody loves to eat these green pellets. And the green pellets are delicious. And then Charlton Heston, who's the hard-boiled detective, makes an astounding discovery. Soil and green made out of people. Which is very depressing to him. And um, this turns out to be a wonderful analogy for a word processor made out of people. So how does it work? In the word processor is a button now called shorten. You click the shorten button after highlighting a paragraph. And in real time, while you wait, the paragraph intelligently shortens itself. You can tell it how short you need it to be. And within about two minutes, thanks to the work of probably about a dozen mechanical Turkers, each assigned a different part of the task in order to assure redundancy and quality, you end up with a shortened paragraph. Now, if it takes two minutes for one paragraph, how long do you suppose it takes to shorten 10 paragraphs? Two minutes is exactly right, Dan. Two minutes, because we just break it into parallel processing. There are innumerable people waiting to help shorten your paragraphs. So just imagine, it's the day before the deadline of your draft of the company. Annual report is due to the regulatory authorities in the quiet period. And it's just a little too long. What employee wouldn't want to hit the shorten button and send it out to thousands of strangers to go over it and make it short? You can see the impact of this innovation as what looks like a computer can end up at just the right moment having a person inside. 
But now how much would this cost? At Mechanical Turk rates, it might be something. Well, why pay even a penny when you can do something for free? And that's the question asked as we've seen some brilliant researchers and companies make gaming the gateway to work. So a brilliant researcher named Louise Von Ann at Carnegie Mellon in the United States came up in 2006 with this, the ESP game. And it's a way of doing the image labeling task, like trucks, trucks, without having to pay people anything. You show two players the image, and they are to guess what the other player is guessing. And when they agree, each of them scores points. And in the meantime, the images get labeled, labeled independently so that you know that they're pretty reliably labeled as well. The points end up filling this thermometer from what appears to be the wrong end, and you just accrue lots of points. What are the points good for? Nothing. The points are good for nothing. But people really like points. In fact, Luis found that he could get generated through the ESP game 4.1 million labels with thousands of players playing, many of whom play for over 20 hours a week. He says his thesis advisor made it so that if they were coming from .edu, the American educational domain, they'd get cut off after 20 hours and told to get back to work on their thesis creating American competitiveness versus those from .ac or other countries where they don't have this limit imposed. And then he started to find people actually play anything. This is actually a performance art styled as a game called Waiting for Godot. This game has 99 levels. And um, it is not the most exciting game in the world. <laughs> That's pretty much the game. Many people play Waiting for Godot through all 99 levels, which just shows you you give people a game, they really want to play it. So Luis does the math, and he says, you know, 5,000 people playing at the same time could label everything on Google in 30 days. And there's individual games online that easily accrue over 5,000 players. Google, of course, took notice licensed the ESP game, and Louise, in turn, created GWAP, Games with a Purpose, all sorts of games where you engage in some activity that is helping somebody from far away. Now, this has been taken to an even more interesting level, one that actually tests the pyramid that I opened with, because there's a game out there that solves a task that you would think is at the top of the pyramid, but invites people without any particular skill to take a crack at it. And this is called Human Computing for Electronic Design Automation. Electronic design automation is the kind of field that tries to figure out how to take transistors and cram them ever closer together on a chip. And it's not easy to do. There's lots of different ways to do it. Even a brute force experiment, just simulating it by computer, doesn't, in time, give you all the right combinations and tell you how to build a more efficient chip. So what these researchers did was they invented a game a game where you, the player, click along the rectangles on the periphery, and that changes the circles in the middle into different colors as you click. And you're not even sure why, but the goal of the game to win points is simply to click on those external rectangles until all of your dots are green. And as you play it, you kind of get an intuition for it. And if you can turn everything green, it will mean that you have solved a problem in electronic design automation that even the maker of the game had not yet solved. Congratulations, here are your points, and in the meantime, a chip maker has reason to be happy. Okay, so I'm a law professor. That means my job is sometimes to ask uh, annoying questions about the future and put, put them to you. So here's a hypothetical. Suppose it's a Saturday morning, and your child is happily safe off the streets, in the room, playing on the computer, having a great time racking up points on one of the games found at this popular kid's site. And it turns out she's playing game number four, Get the Circles Green Game, having a great time earning points, maybe doing some good work for somebody else in the meantime. Does anybody have a problem with that? I see not one hand raised. How many people are OK with that? Some more hands go up. How many people are confused or unwilling to answer? 
All right, a few more hands go up, leaving only the diehards who will not raise their hands under any circumstances. All right, hold that thought. I'm going to come back to it with a follow-up hypothetical. But in the meantime, let's start thinking about what happens when you combine the willingness of the kinds of people who are ready to play Waiting for Godot at any moment with, say, mobile or other innovations taking place. This is a 2006 innovation. Texas Governor Rick Perry decided to set up webcams along the border with Mexico and importuned people to watch them. So they did, and just kept an eye out for anybody crossing a lot of free labor. Over here, it has since been generalized. This company in the United Kingdom sets it up so that lots of people who have nothing to do and want to watch stuff can watch CCTV all day waiting for something bad to happen and report it. <laughs> if not enough bad things happen, you can salt the video with fake bad things that keep them watching because, here's how it says, viewers register for free with no recurring fees. <laughs> you don't have to pay anything to watch the CCTV. <laughs> and then when you see something, you hit it and maybe you earn a bounty if somebody gets caught. In fact, this has been generalized. Here's now a business where, if you've got nothing better to do, why not write down the license plates of every car you see? On the unlikely possibility that one of them is up for repossession, you report it, it gets repossessed, you collect a bounty. And in the meantime now, we have an army of spies of people who have nothing better to do but wait for their ship to come in. We've seen the same phenomenon again in 2006 where at the University of Colorado, a bunch of students smoked marijuana on April 20th, Let's All Smoke Marijuana Day, out on the field. They said to the police, you can't arrest us all. The police said, you're right, but we'll take pictures of you all. And now, at 50 quid per picture, who wants to identify this person? Yes, probably the FBI's least most wanted, but now there's a system by which to get her identified. Now, that's version 1.0. Let's fast forward to just after the disputed elections in Iran, where there were protests in the streets. And before too long, there was a website put up, affiliated with the government, that simply had the pictures of protesters they couldn't identify and importuned people to report them. Now, there's a ceiling as to how many reports they're going to get, because the people most likely to know people are the ones also realizing what might happen and least likely to want to report them. So now, here's where I go hypothetical again. What if we were to find a way to put this into a platform like Mechanical Turk? So how might we do that? Well, let's suppose, since we're a government, we have 72 million ID card photos. We take them off the ID cards, and we just make it a task. For one penny, tell me if this person is among any of these four. Then repeat, repeat. And a back-of-the-envelope estimate says that approximately 16,000 US dollars will buy you a 90% accurate arbitrary identification of one unknown person amidst 72 million possibilities, which is a pretty amazing economy of scale. But now why pay anything when you can pay nothing? So here's the bookend hypothetical. It's a Saturday morning. Your kid is happily playing on the computer. She's earning points playing the concentration game. <laughs> How many of you have a problem with that? <laughs> a few more hands go up. How many people happy to see skills getting learned? <laughs> At least one. How many people confused and unwilling to weigh in further? All right, shifted a bunch of people, of course, by turning every possible dial I could to 11, involving kids, involving non-disclosure, involving political dissent. But you start to see the ways in which having such a ready supply, that innovation, leads to cascade effects of innovation. One more component to this puzzle. Here's a Mechanical Turk task for 50 cents, I'm sorry, $2. Review the website natmedtalk.com on your blog. You have to have a real blog. If you do, review this, and we'll pay you $2. And then all of a sudden, around the web, people are talking about NatMed Talk. Now, this doesn't have to say that it has to be positive, but people get the message. And sometimes the message is clearer, as in this one. Write a positive 5 out of 5 review for a product on a website. Tell a story of why you bought the product. Thank the website for making you such a great deal. Mark any other negative reviews as not helpful once you post yours. <laughs> 
the website in question turned out to be Amazon.com, so one arm of the octopus started grabbing another arm of the same octopus. Now, it may not come as a surprise that there is now a generalized way to take that which is social online and try to kind of put a little money into it, to spin it one way or the other. This website, subvertandprofit.com, sells digs and YouTube likes and everything else, cash and carry. You can take the worst video in the world and pump up its likes by visiting subvertandprofit.com. But what happens when it comes into the real world? So lots of lobbying takes place. Companies and others ask people at large to agree with them on something and then let their elected representatives know. During the healthcare reform debates in America, this was one such group that did that, gethealthreformright.org, although it went one step further. It actually went into Facebook and started paying virtual Facebook dollars to people if they would write their real world member of US Congress and oppose the bill, the health care reform bill. And then the only thing that could make it better would be if they were opposing the farm bill, because they'd have virtual carrots being put into subsidies for real carrots. But you start to see the ways in which it gets easy now to say, wait a minute, I need a crowd outside, I don't know, Herod's in 20 minutes with the following signs bearing the following angry messages. Type it in, hit go, and anybody nearby can suddenly be drawn towards it. Or how about I'd like to keep an eye on this house? So suddenly I'm walking down the street, mobile alert comes on my phone. 50 cent opportunity or three carrots, my choice, if I am to walk to the house and just take a picture and move right along. And if you're inside the house, all you see are one person after another coming and taking pictures of you. They don't know why, you don't know why, but now you're under surveillance. In fact, I gave this hypothetical in a class I was teaching last autumn. Some of the students thought it was such a great idea, they've invented this and put it into the MIT entrepreneurship competition. The crowd clam alert for journalists. So if there's something going on in the world, boom, you use location tracking to figure out who's nearby, pay them a dollar a minute, and before you know it, not only do you have them filming it, but you actually can control which way they want to pan the camera in order to zoom in on exactly the right shot. So I see for every worrisome thing a good thing, this is Text Eagle, which lets you in Africa text customers to tell you the price of bread in a market. Knowable to them, very difficult to find out from afar. I see, when I look at the robot again, from every bad now, or for, I'm sorry, for every good, a possible bad. What's inside the robot? Is it ticking? Who's making money off this? Is this FedEx fourth class? I mean, what's going on here? And I see now, for my Iranian hypothetical, which I told to a guy named Ben Rigby, who runs a site called The Extraordinaries, which is a micro-labor site for nonprofits, so people can do micro-labor for free helping out a nonprofit. After the Haiti earthquake, he came up with a site that would let people go through photos of missing people, compare them against photos taken after the quake, and make matches of those who had been missing but now can be seen. Thousands of people used the site, led to about a dozen actionable leads. So then, for every bad, a possible good. I end with this rather provocative Amazon Mechanical Turk task. Do something kind and then take a photo of it. It's pictured here as a kind machine. People go into this funnel, gears process them, and hearts come out the other side. Another odd metaphor. But the basic idea is you can get $2 to do something good in the world, document it, and send it in. And your reaction either is, at last, the internet has reached apotheosis. We have found a way to turn money into love. Or you say, the next time somebody does something nice for me, I wonder if they're doing it because they're nice, or because they're about to go and collect their pellet of Soylent Green. Thank you very much. <laughs>